So actually this presentation might be deemed somewhat foundational and futuristic with respect to the conversations that have happened so far about this very impressive 4C effort. Uh, and so I want everyone to keep that in mind. This is not a presentation of scientific results, but a statement about some progress that is under uh, happening that is maybe going to fundamentally change the access to data for research such as what 4C conducts. Um, I think the question that's posed is, will standardized data accessible from EHRs via APIs serve efforts such as 4C to capture clinical course data for COVID and future epidemics and, pan and pandemics? And um, when everyone is talking about interoperability and the evolution of uh, healthcare IT, it's always important to be humble and kind of ob observe how the process is slow and halting, even though it's been accelerating in the last several years. But at the end of my, my talk, at, at the beginning of my talk as well, it's true that it's really never jammed today, it's always jammed tomorrow, to quote a recent article about um, sci uh, actually uh, fusion reactors. So this is about the near term future, not today. Um, the basis for this talk, though, is the uh, regulation that is making interoperability become a fund a fundamentally woven into the EHR landscape, uh, certainly in the United States. Uh, and by the end of 2022, about 12 months from now, all of the EHRs that are certified in the US will be exposing FHIR-based APIs, this HL7 FHIR standard that uh, was earlier mentioned by uh, one of the German scientists, uh, for example. And here in the United States, this particular thing will up everyone's game to a certain standard level. Uh, and the standard level will include FHIR semantics for what's called the US Core for Data Interoperability data sets, uh, which includes a lot of the structured data, but also adds free text clinical notes and is available through OAuth access. Uh, and the API types um, are FHIR, the patient access API for consumer apps, Bulk, fire bulk data, uh, and also smart and fire clinical apps for clinical data. Uh, and the use cases are patient access, smart health cards. I'm sure a number of you are familiar with the, the COVID vax status cards that smart health cards have made available for uh, certainly a number of people in the US and also now internationally. Uh, and I think the special case and the interesting case today is for pop health using fire bulk data. It's more than pop health. It's really just getting data about lots of patients at once through FHIR data sets from EHRs. The scope of data that will be uh, required at the end of 2022 is a small superset of what's uh, required today, or I should say part of the US common clinical data set. Uh, I'm not gonna read this, but a lot of the data here in some respects correspond to the types of data that reading the 4C papers suggests there's a lot of overlap, which means that the a potential for having some of these sites that do not support or are able to deliver I2B2 data to be able to uh, actually provide data. Uh, and the truth is that data uh, is moving to fire uh, for a variety of reasons, regulation, the actions of vendors, lots of people in research who are using versions of fire uh, from REDCap, from the major data, uh, I should say from the major Silicon Valley vendors and the like. So we know that there's a very large movement underway to do this, which means a lot of investment and a lot of possibilities. Now, when you compare that to the work that's being done traditionally in the academic medical centers, and of course, uh, the sites involve OMAP, I2B2, and PCORNET, you realize that the academic medical centers are able to produce, as 4C has demonstrated, a tremendous amount of results very quickly using established tools. But the limit it has is in terms of the number of sites that can provide those data, which are very small compared to the global set of uh, medical centers that do have patients, for example, who have suffered severely because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and the consequ consequence is that a lot of data cannot be tapped, and it would be very costly and, com and complex to be able to do that. So one problem, however, is that the FHIR data has not really been thoroughly vetted or even, I would say, marginally vetted for research uses. So now I'm going to briefly describe in two minutes a project that's underway. I've been working with uh, the, the uh, group of people in the uh, All of Us Research Program, uh, there are four sites who are going to be comparing OMOP extracts versus FHIR. The OMOP data in question are all the data that are sent to the All of Us Research uh, project. The data themselves are not being sent. Randomly selected patients whose data will be looked at. There will be a comparison of the OMOP ETL PET line and uh, fire that comes directly from their servers. 
And the goal is to do both a pipeline comparison and a gap in difference analysis in the data at the, uh, for all those patients and then summarize it. Obviously, the data of individual patients will not be sent out. Uh, and for example, the, the pipeline diagnosis will show the differences between constructing curated data for OMOP and what comes out of EHR systems, which are in some respects not transparent. They convert their EHR data into standardized fire uh, payloads. But that comparison will be very illuminating and may well uh, allow researchers to be able to make suggestions both to vendors and providers to make uh, suggestions to the vendors to make improvements in the fire data that's extracted. On the other hand, it's also quite possible that some of the results of this will demonstrate that there are some aspects to fire data that are better or superior to the OMOP data. I'm not saying that because we know that, but we have some preliminary results in this study to suggest that there will be some interesting findings. Um, a key point, though, is that the rate at which this is happening suggests that sometime in the period 2023 and 24, because fire bulk data will become available, uh, it may be possible that there are situation-specific slices of the data that may suffice for research. And then it's possible that many non-academic medical center sites can provide data. And this will provide two benefits at least. First, lower latency is possible and larger samples. Obviously, this could be something that ultimately infiltrates research efforts, including those of 4C. Now, one of the things that I did was a quick check of the current literature that's been produced by the 4C uh, effort, uh, and just looking at the type of things that one wants to evaluate about EHR data. Obviously, data access via API uh, will not address all the key six considerations that were described in this paper, but certainly it will be uh, interesting and important to understand the differences and the benefits of the data collection and handling aspects of FIRE, and also compare the types of data that are codified and textual. And again, because clinical notes, free text clinical notes, will become part of the standard FIRE payloads uh, across all the different ways in which it's produced, that could do a great deal to help correct some of the inadequacies or limits of those uh, standardized data pack packages. In addition, because the FIRE data will be emerging and may be used directly analytically, transparency of data and analytic code may be more readily achievable across sites and across nations. Um, now, that said, when one actually looks at what's necessary to uh, compare and contrast data across various academic sites, and various research sites, one of the things that happens in all studies, uh, yours included, and clearly it has to, is that you end up having to set, subset the data that you can realistically compare. And so one of the things that's interesting about this is that when you actually look at the results of what you actually can compare, it may be again that by checklisting it, a great deal of the data that comes out of the API, albeit non-curated, may be the same type of data that you're getting through the studies, your, your gold standard studies. And so it may be possible to imagine incorporating those at least experimentally, at least comparatively within one to two years. David, you have two minutes. Very good. Uh, so let me go back and just then say um, the goal, uh, which I think was captured very well in this paper about what everyone should know, is for interoperability, of course, is that the data uh, can be aggregated across all sites with a minimum amount of human intervention. I think we all know that that is many, many years away. But again, when you look at what actually happens in studies, it may be the case that a very substantial amount of data can come from sites that otherwise could not deliver data into research projects. And so a statement that was made, I think, uh, in, the, in the first session was, to of understanding that anticipating that this type of both international and within nation uh, analysis of data for pandemics and epidemics, understanding that this is probably going to be in both an ongoing, it is an ongoing threat, and there's an ongoing opportunity to anticipate it. A number of the things that might result in pre-mitigation are adoptions and promotions of these interoperable standards and incorporating in that, of course, understanding of the respective pipelines between the curated and non-curated varieties, as well as understanding what the IRB convergences have to be uh, at in individual institutions and again, across countries, so that a number of these uh, particular early warning systems that have often been talked about might well be built into the research 
uh, infrastructure going forward. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this very fast and brief review of what's happening in fire, some of the work that's being done to compare it to gold, one of the gold standards, clinical data models, and how it might be tapped uh, to get larger samples and lower latency uh, may be of benefit, at least a little bit over the horizon for the 4 C effort. And I'll take any questions now or at the panel. Thank you. Okay, no questions. Why don't we move on um, to Sean? I, I, would have, I would have a quick question for Lavia speaking. A great presentation uh, as usual, David. How is the semantics being tight within those different implementation? Because for example, when you're comparing with OMOP versus FIRE uh, for the all of us across the four sites, uh, my bet it only depends on how the implementation of uh, fire was uh, done, and so yes. how does semantics being done? Yes. So what we what we're doing in our data quality assessment is that in this case the four sites are fully exposing uh, their OMOP pipeline, what they do, and we can already see across those sites that there's a variation. What we're not able to see into is the implementations that happen from the EHR vendor. And in fact, for this study, it's going to be Epic uh, and maybe one Cerner site. That's, that's our expectation. We don't know how they're doing this, this particular mapping. Uh, so what we're doing is we're saying, look, we can compare the results that we're getting uh, for uh, vitals, conditions, labs and the like. And what we're going to do is detect those differences. Uh, what we're then going to do is likely one, scale up the study next year and do with get more sites. The other one is to go back and actually talk to the vendors and be able to show them some of these differences uh, that happen. It's not the case that we're going to have, to, we're not going to have uh, an understanding of the internal mechanics by which they do this. One of the things that slightly mitigates this, Paul, is that the uh, requirements for the data that come out include standardized coding in order to be certified. Uh, but even there, to, to answer your point, it's probably going to be because we use well-defined pipelines that have been curated and then compare it to the fire uh, data that's, that's actually pushed out of, or pulled from APIs that will have a sense of what might be going on. We'll have much better information about this in about three months when we complete this first pass in comparison. Okay, we, it looks like we have a question in the chat. What is the smoothest path to the addition? Oops, I lost my chat. Uh, yeah, I see that question. Yeah, okay. So I can speak to it. First, there is an actual uh, HL7 group uh, working with Odyssey uh, to uh, see how it is possible to have some type of convergence in the two endeavors. Uh, there are also efforts to do what's called OMOP on fire, where you produce OMOP data from fire. But I think the other one is actually more interesting, which is fire and OMOP, where you can take OMOP results and produce fire so you can get some of the interoperability characteristics for uh, apps and the like. But, um, and I'm looking also at another point, uh, exactly, about epic and patterns and the like. So a lot of the data issues are at the, at the most basic level, this idea of comparing gold standard clinical data model results that are built on curated sets to the same data for the same patients at the same centers that come from the fire servers is something that we think uh, is scalable because we'll be able to do this uh, at many academic centers and begin to identify uh, very, uh, I would say statistically, what these differences are. The goal most certainly is to then go back to the EHR vendors uh, and work with them. It's also true that the, uh, the vendors are not the exclusive source of the variation as the papers, the paper uh, that I was citing, for example, point out. The variation can happen because of both implementation issues within a particular provider site and the practices at those sites. Uh, the work we're talking about here cannot directly address that. 
it would almost certainly just be because as data quality improves, people become more invested in stamping out further sources of variation that are purely idiosyncratic and may or may not happen, but we'll see.